So the last part of our discussion really uh, is, I think, uh, addressing one of the big challenges that we have with breast cancer. I think we've done a really good job. Uh, we could do better, but we've done a really good job so far with uh, ER positive breast cancer. I think we've done a very good job with HER2 positive breast cancer. But really, triple negative breast cancer now is a topic that is, uh, I think, on everybody's minds. First of all, what is it? I think we're not 100% not sure what triple negative breast cancer really is. Is it a diagnosis of exclusion? Does it have real characteristics? Um, but more importantly, what do we do when someone comes into our clinics with that diagnosis of triple negative breast cancer. And I think that uh, what's really on everybody's minds after San Antonio this year uh, is really what's the proper management, at least for the neoadjuvant therapy for triple negative breast cancer. I think a lot of women who come in to us now will get neoadjuvant therapy if you have surgeons that are into that sort of thing, if you're part of country where, or internationally where the surgeons uh, agree that if someone's gonna get chemotherapy after, they might as well just get it before. Um, and so I think, what is the proper management uh, now? Should we be adding platinum agents? And uh, uh, I'll start with Christy. I mean, what do you think? You know, should we be adding platinum now in 2016? In the in the neoadjuvant in the neoadjuvant setting, triple negative breast cancer. Well, I had been saying no up until the uh, <laughs> von Minkwitz presentation uh, at San Antonio, and I'm not sure I'm quite there yet. Uh, but that was a presentation where patients were on a a regimen I wouldn't use, which is paclitaxel plus non-pegylated liposomal doxorubicin. Right. Does anybody uh, use that regimen? Uh, oh, as the no, base no, therapy. We don't have that drug. We don't <laughs> have, the US. Right. Right. Correct. Um, and it was with or without carboplatin, <clears throat> although some patients also got bevacizumab as part of this uh, tr trial as well. It was well. a very kind of strange regimen. Yeah. So um, what it... And my impression had been that the triple negative patients who were actually benefiting from the carboplatin were going to always be the BRCA mutated patients, and that's what would fall out here, and that's not what has fallen out. Which is very unusual. Right. So that the BRCA mutated patients do, did not seem to get uh, the benefit from adding carboplatin, and the, just the, the triple negative patients who were wild type uh, BRCA uh, were, did seem to get a significant advantage. Uh, not only in pathologic complete response rate, but also what appears to be translating into disease-free survival by the addition of carboplatin. And it has now made me think about it a little bit more. I've not yet added it. The thing I just want to point out about that is that they, they um, took out the alkylator, or they took out the cyclophosphamide. So, you know, doxorubicin, of course, is a good DNA damaging agent. We probably need that in a subset, at least, of these triple negatives that have homologous recombination deficiency. Whether that low dose of liposomal doxorubicin at the 20 per meter was enough of a DNA damage, I worry. Now, platinum really nicely made up for the lack, and I think that raises a great question. Is that platinum a better DNA damaging agent for those patients in cyclone? And I think yeah. that's a really good question. Or or even what that says is they had an inferior neoadjuvant regimen Precisely. that Precisely. the carbo made up for. Right. I never right. thought of that. That's actually yeah. a good way of and, thinking and about it. And it's corroborated by the 40603 CLGB Psychoff trial that also updated and disease-free survival was not improved with the addition of the uh, carbo to the paclitaxel preoperatively. There was an intriguing 5% difference in terms of the absolute numbers, but it wasn't significant. But of course, as Angie DeMichel with her lovely um, discussion right. said, discussion. neither trial was really powered to look and at disease-free survival. You know, they gave the carbo AUC of two in the GBG trial and uh, AUC of six, only four doses. I mean, there may be something to longer exposure, but I really have thought about it similarly to what you're saying is That's that really the point. The, the lower dose of anthracycline uh, may have made a difference. And the carbo dose was low. It was an AC of 1.5, so because that was too toxic all otherwise altogether. But no, but it's making up for an inferior baseline right. regimen. And I think that That's was it. Point. And, I never um, of that. and I thought Angie's bottom line, which I thought was really great, was she said that it's really not probably the standard of care at this time. We really need the larger trials published, you know, powered for disease free survival. However, for the individual patient, perhaps the BRCA mutant patient or the very high-risk patient, you know, you really want, because there was a delta of 13% improvement in PATH-CR, so the patient that, you know, really wants that, um, you know, breast conserving surgery or you need a very, very robust response. So she left it open, and I, I agree with that. I think we may all use it from time to time in patients, but, but not... I also so think that there, there, there are patients who... Well, let's go to the Psychoff regimen. Let's talk about the Psychoff trial. The Psychoff trial, if I'm not mistaken, was... Typical AC weekly, weekly paclitaxel right. with or without carbo, AUC of six, AUC of six every three weeks. Every three weeks. Mm -hmm. So that's typical. That's like we, you mm -hmm. know, all use AC mm -hmm. weekly taxol, you mm -hmm. know, and we all would use carbo in AUC of six. A lot of us may use it weekly. Who knows? Mm -hmm. But nonetheless, 
that didn't seem to show a disease she survival benefit. Right, but I think that, you know, again, the trial <coughs> population, it, the trials were not uh, powered to show a survival difference. And the delta makes all of the difference here in terms of uh, what happens to these patients. And so I think that, you know, also the other thing, which I think is a really important point that Angie made and we talk a lot about in the iSpy2 network is that, you know, if you look at residual cancer burden versus looking at path CR, you have different numbers. And in our data set, even from iSpy1, uh, looking at standard therapy, the patients who had RCB1, so those who had a residual cancer burden that was minimal but had residual invasive cancer had the same outcome as the people who had no invasive cancer. So, you know, you're in a very complicated situation where you're trying to look at, you know, what happens to people over time with disease-free survival benefit. And a lot of people with triple negative breast cancer have RCB0 or 1. And so if you maybe looked at that, which of course they'll do over the future, it, it will change the PCR rate. And in iSpy2, when we've had these, you know, specially trained by Fraser Simmons from MD Anderson pathologists, our path CR rates have gone down. Yeah. Because basically when you have really specialized pathologists looking at these path CR rates, you get a different rate than when you report it in a large, each institution does their own. So it's a complicated area and I, I don't think we know. I mean, what I've done personally and I think many of us may do is that when you see these poor responders, we tend to add. Mm -hmm. So a poor responder with triple negative disease, I'll add platinum uh, as opposed to starting with it since we already know we get a reasonable path CR rate in those patients. And we're now designing clinical trials for those patients, whether it's post-surgery or pre-surgery, where you take the patients who are poor responders and partway through, which we have to figure out, we add in something new to see if we can really change the outcome of these uh, patients. But that's the question. This is changing disease. the past CR rate 10 percent going to make it? Just like Angie, you know, just like a presentation. Is changing it 10 percent going to make a difference mm -hmm. clinically in terms of disease-free survival? Well, I, just, I do want to just mention very briefly the Create X trial. Because uh, that was one of the big data sets coming out of San Antonio, speaking of what Hope just said about that, those patients who don't get the path CRs. You know, not the RCB1s, which do very, very trial. well. It was, but. Fascinating trial. And, you know, um, you know re relatively small, 900 patients, mixture of triple negative and ER positive, who received eight cycles of capecitabine versus not if they had either nodes positive residual or disease in breast and had improvement in both disease-free and overall survival with the capecitabine for the uh, eight cycles, six months, but really the, the benefit looked mostly in the triple negative mm -hmm. population. Very, very interesting data. My personal opinion is that it is something worth discussing with some patients. It is, but let me ask you a question. So what the question, and then maybe they answered this afterwards somewhere, what was their original pathologic CR rate of their original chemotherapy? in that create extra. Well, they didn't, they didn't enroll patients in that way. So they weren't enrolled at the start of neoadjuvant therapy. They just came with residual disease. So you so, can't really go back. And that's the problem. You, you have don't no have an idea whether with. they had inferior standard but all of the, care no, no, we do know what they got. therapy. No, no, no. That, it's quite clear that 95% of them got anthocyclines and taxanes, mm -hmm. either sequentially or con in combination. But what what were the doses? You know, yeah. were they delivered properly? No, and they did, he didn't know that at the time of the presentation, but right. they'll obviously figure it out for their next for the one. Well, and for the publication. But I think that, that's one you know, like the, to see the thing is, all that. trials that are looking at post-neoadjuvant therapy don't control the neoadjuvant therapy, if, except for to say you need an anthracycline and taxane. But so, what they, I mean, hopefully, hopefully when you see this data on post, the lesson hopefully, is when you see a post-neoadjuvant trial, they will specify very clearly the doses and the delivery of the neoadjuvant chemotherapy. I think it's important. It's yes, extremely yes, important. Yes, yeah. Because one, because the, the, the simple hypothesis is just they got inferior neoadjuvant th chemotherapy. But, you know what else is really interesting? I have never had a patient, I mean, may, I think actually it's not true, I might have had two patients ever tolerate 2,500 milligrams per meter squared of capecitabine, and that's the dose they gave, and their dose intensity was very good. And we know that the metabolism of capecitabine is different in many, not all, Asian people yeah. based on differences in pharmacogenomics. And I think the exposure to drug may just be different. Uh, it's a fascinating question about whether or not you would see a difference, not just in toxicity, but in efficacy, because Joyce, you did the combination study. What was your dose of uh, Cape Cytobine? Um At the end of the day, we were really able to get in around 1650. We had to dose reduce from- Because of the combination. Yeah, because of the combination, yeah. But and they, they had a 25%, I think, dose yes. reduction mm -hmm. in that yeah, study. Yeah, I mean, most people would start at two. 
Right. Mm -hmm. But then we dose the reduce from there, you see, we so right. we give less. Yeah, we but I thought what was more fascinating is when I use a load as a single agent of triple negative metastatic breast cancer, really Doesn't low work. response <laughs> rates, really short. Well, that's why and I'm you give it to someone who's ER positive and you get this really prolonged benefit and on this given, drug at lowest doses. And it was given in one of the JEPAR series of trials. Mm -hmm. Remember, that's mm -hmm. what Gunther von Minquitz got up right. actually and spoke and, and, you know, and said, we've given this in like, I don't forgot what JEPAR, Quarto or whatever, which one it was and didn't really add to the past CR rate. So if you had TAC times, I think, three or four. And then they switched to venerelbine. Either venerelbine and capecitabine, you didn't respond. You didn't have an additional response. But the systemic outcome in that Gephardt trio was surprising that it actually came through with an improved they did really well. survival. Yeah. Two other points, FENXX, it, it did. Yeah, it did, yeah, and I guess you're right. And systemic. And also, the US Oncology Trial 0062 published in Clinical Cancer Research last year that added the CAPE, you know, to the dose taxol only four cycles, and then the FinXX, which did six cycles of the CAPE side. I mean, if you look at the subsets, both the, in both the triple negative benefited. So in the systemic benefit, though, not the systemic, breast benefit. Systemic. So maybe there's something there it, with the systemic the benefit trials, besides the breast. You know, the trials Good are point. different because they gave it in combination and they gave lower doses. All three in trials short, did. Short so I think it does. Uh, I agree. There. I can be mm -hmm. convinced. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I don't know. So you would think about using it now. I mean, the question for people listening to this: I think it has to be addressed in the next generation of trials. I mean, is it a control arm? You know, et cetera. I think. But if somebody has significant residual disease and a very poor, again, you know, I would do it for a person who has RCV1. No. But if they have, you know, positive mm -hmm. nodes with triple negative disease after good neoadjuvant therapy, these patients have a poor outcome. Mm -hmm. So they do. You know, yeah. a patient with a BRCA mutation, I'd probably use a platinum, but mm -hmm. uh, based on mm -hmm. the Polish data, which is quite impressive. But um, so was in the in the CCOF trial was there in Bill's trial was there analysis by BRCA status? I forget. The path CR rate was higher in the uh, with the patients who the had BRCA, BRCA mutations, but not the DFS, not the CCOF. No, they didn't look, they didn't look at that because it's the numbers are in all are the so trials small. are too. Small. Too small. Yeah, you really have to be careful about. Do you use it in your patients, Sarah? Uh, Capecitabine. Yeah. Yeah. In the in hormone the receptor. Ne yeah. If they had exactly what what Hope has been saying and, and Joyce as well, I think it warrants a discussion with patients um, who have had standard therapy and have a lot of residual disease if they're hormone receptor negative. So it sounds like what I'm hearing is that basically all of us would agree platinums in certain settings, maybe BRCA positive, maybe high a lot of disease and potentially adjuvant capecitabine in certain settings also. That's what I'm hearing. Okay. Potentially. All right, so let's turn a little.